uh, the uh, I am kind of graduated into. Um, so let's uh, do this. Uh, it's the navigable connection between the Great Lakes and the Mississippi River and uh, creates these two huge watersheds, one of the few canals in the country that does that. And why it was possible is here in Chicago we had a very uh, breachable watershed divide. The um, uh, land formed is uh, just about uh, 15 or 20 feet above Lake Michigan in, in its present form, but historically Lake Michigan flowed out uh, through its southwest corner. And uh, Arquette and Joliet came up and turned uh, into the, the off the Des Plaines River into Portage Creek. And of course, uh, they had the vision, as uh, Arnie explained, for this connection, which became uh, the first incarnation, incarnation of that was the INM Canal. Uh, INM Canal, don't need to tell very much about this, 96 miles uh, in length with about uh, 15 or 16 rocks. And uh, here you see Lox 3 and 4, uh, just north of Joliet. Uh, Lox 1 through 4 were replaced when the sanitary ship canal was built. But suggest, uh, congestion in the Chicago River, primarily due to these uh, center pier swing bridges, which you can see faintly in the middle under the Dearborn Bridge, um, forced a lot of the navigable, navigable traffic to move to the Calumet area. And some of these center piers Bridges persisted until the 1920s. There was a great movement to promote, promote the deep waterway even before the Sanitary Ship Canal was built. For instance, there was a big convention in Peoria in 1887. Uh, drew over 600 delegates to get uh, support for this. But the federal government had no policy on water resource development. Well, Chicago's sanitary problem intervened. They had to do something about the wastewater flowing into Lake Michigan. So they built the Sanitary and Ship Canal, 28 miles of length plus 10 miles of improvements on the rivers on either end. And all of that was done by local taxpayers. And it kind of opened the eyes of the people in the feds, federal government about water resources. And of course, I've written a book about this. It's back on the windowsill in the back of the room if you're interested in looking at it. Um, one of the biggest projects to a lot of world visitors who also came here for the 1893 Columbian Exposition. Well, federal authorization got around to the uh, waterways in 1899. The Rivers and Harbors Act authorized permits to be issued, so the Sanitary District had to get permits to connect this new canal to Lake Michigan. Uh, and in 1907, Congress finally authorized the uh, Illinois Waterway uh, from LaSalle to Grafton as a federal uh, waterway. The ship canal uh, was built, was extended in 1907 uh, to build a powerhouse and the first lock, uh, which replaced those first, first four locks of the INM canal. Later, the Cal Sag channel was built in 1911, uh, 1922. However, it was very narrow, only 60 feet wide because uh, the federal government wouldn't give a permit for a larger canal. They didn't want too much water to be drawn out of Lake Michigan. Here you see the canal being built through Blue Island. Uh, the economy like the power tried to build a power project on the uh, Des Plaines River near the mouth of the DuPage, uh, but it got flooded out, and it was also stopped by litigation. It never happened. Uh, the uh, State of Illinois first tried to build the Illinois Waterway. It was a state referendum. The vote was approved, uh, and the work began uh, after 1920. The feds approved the project, uh, but eventually the state ran out of money. Meanwhile, there was litigation over the diversion of water from the Great Lakes, and the decree that was issued in 1930 cut down the water amount. So the feds stepped in to finish the construction of the canal. That narrow uh, Cal Sag channel had to be widened to allow boats, so there was federal authorization to build some passing places. And then later in 1946, there was a federal authorization for a complete redo of the Cal Sag channel and a new lock. And uh, that work began in the 1950s and it expanded the uh, width of the canal by fourfold. 
And uh, of course, here's the O'Brien Lock and Dam on the Cabinet River just south of 130th Street. It uh, has sluice gates in it to, to allow diversion of water in addition to what water is used in passing traffic. And this, the control of the water in the entire canal system in Chicago is under the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District. Well, here's the profile of the Illinois River. Got eight pools from the Alton Pool, which is backed up from the uh, Lock and Dam 26 on the Mississippi River, uh, stair step all the way up to the Lockport Pool, which is the canal system in Chicago. Uh, many people don't realize that, but that's the way it is. The two highest lift locks are the Brandon Road Lock and Dam and the Lockport Lock. And you can see the Illinois Waterway in context to all the other federal waterways in the country. It's the only link connecting these two great watersheds uh, out of all the canals that are supported by the federal government. And uh, so about the, uh, it took uh, uh, nearly 300 years from the vision of, of uh, Marquette and Joliet to get to where we were uh, today. And, but for the last 50 years, there have been no major developments on the Illinois Waterway. And the question is, um, what uh, is coming up for the future? Thank you very much.